the only way they're going to bring down inflation and restore price stability is to crash the economy. One of the senators asked Powell if he was willing to do whatever it takes, like Paul Volcker, to bring down inflation. Will you do whatever it takes? And Powell basically said, yes, we will do whatever it takes, which obviously is not the case, because if the Fed was willing to do whatever it takes, it would have already done it. There is no reason to have allowed inflation to get this bad. In fact, there's no reason for the Fed's balance sheet to still be expanding if the Fed was actually going to do whatever it took. In fact, if the investors believed that Powell was going to do whatever it takes to bring down inflation, the stock market would have crashed. The bond market would have crashed. In fact, one of the questions that Powell got was how he was going to fight inflation without harming the economy or causing a recession. Now, the real answer would have been, I can't. If we're going to fight inflation, we're going to have a recession. There's just no way around it. We're going to have to raise interest rates substantially. We're going to have to cut down on the growth of the money supply. And the entire recovery that we had, the economy was built on cheap money. So if we're going to take that cheap money away, which we need to do, then the entire economy that was built on top of it is going to come collapsing down. So no, we can't fight inflation without hurting the economy. Right? We had a horrible recession under Paul Volcker when interest rates went up. But what Powell told Congress was, hey, don't worry, I'm going to raise interest rates. We're going to shrink the balance sheet, but we're going to do it with care. We're going to be careful and make sure that nothing that we're doing harms the economy. Well, that is impossible. So the only way that Powell can raise interest rates with care and shrink the balance sheet with care without harming the economy is to immediately stop the rate hikes or maybe reverse them as soon as that harm is obvious. That's the only way to do it because you can't do it with care. It is impossible. But nobody in Congress or nobody at the Federal Reserve wants to tell the truth. Yes, there is some medicine that we've got to swallow, but it tastes bad. They all want to pretend that, oh, it's going to taste great. Yes, we're going to get rid of inflation, but don't worry, this medicine is delicious. It's not. And the only way we're not going to taste this bitter medicine is if we don't swallow it. And that's basically what Powell was saying. In fact, Powell's assurance that when it comes to raising interest rate and shrinking the balance sheet, that the Fed will exercise care to make sure that neither of those policies hurts the economy, that is completely inconsistent with his pledge to do whatever it takes to fight inflation, that he's willing to do it Paul Volcker style, because those two statements are mutually exclusive. Because if you are committed to doing whatever it takes to fight inflation, then you can't exercise care not to hurt the economy, because doing whatever it takes means you're willing to hurt the economy. You're willing to crash the financial markets if that's what's required to fight inflation, which means one of those two statements has to be a lie because they can't both be true. And as far as I'm concerned, my money's on the fact that his commitment to doing whatever it takes, that's what's not true. Because I think the minute Powell senses that what he's doing is really hurting the economy or the financial markets, then he will be careful. He will reverse course and allow inflation to get worse because the Fed is going to have to pick its poison. And I already know the poison it's going to pick. Another one of the ridiculous statements that Powell made had to do with the unsustainable fiscal path that the U.S. is on, because one of the senators asked Powell if the Fed considered the impact of higher interest rates on the federal budget. Given the fact that we have $30 trillion in debt, when he raises interest rates, the cost to the government of servicing that debt is going to go up, right? So the senator asked Powell if the Fed factored that into its policy, and Powell said no. Powell said they don't even think about the unsustainable fiscal path. They don't even measure it. They don't model it as if this is happening in a vacuum, which has to be a lie. I mean, how can the Fed possibly not consider the impact of rising interest rates on the U.S. government? When it's obviously the elephant in the room, they're going to think about that elephant. But not only did Powell say that the Fed never even considers it, it doesn't even matter about it. If you combine that with the commitment to do whatever it takes to fight inflation, and if they're not even going to consider the impact of that fight on the federal government, which is the world's biggest debtor and which has the most to lose if interest rates go way up to fight inflation. But not only did Powell make that ridiculous statement, he also followed up by saying, yes, we're on an unsustainable fiscal path, 
but now is not the time to do something about it. He said the time to do something about the fiscal problems is when the economy is strong. But of course, earlier during his testimony, he not only said the economy was strong, he said it's very strong. Well, which is it? Now is not the time to deal with our fiscal problems because we have to wait until we have a strong economy when according to Powell, the economy is not only strong right now, it's very strong. If the economy is very strong, then why don't we deal with the fiscal problems now? The truth is we can never deal with the fiscal problems because then the economy won't be strong because it's a bubble. And it's only a bubble because we're not dealing with the fiscal problems. In fact, it's making the fiscal problem bigger. It's blowing more air into the bubble. It's going deeper and deeper into debt. That is the reason that we have this phony recovery. And in fact, when they were talking about how strong the economy was under Trump, and Trump was talking about we have the strongest economy in the history of the world, you didn't hear Powell telling Congress at that time, hey, we've got a strong economy, let's start addressing the fiscal imbalances and the unsustainable path that we're on. No, and in fact, Powell stated on multiple occasions that the reason we don't have to worry in the short run about the unsustainable path that we're on is because interest rates are really low. Well, now he's saying that he might raise interest rates dramatically like Paul Volcker if that's what it takes to fight inflation, yet ignoring the impact that would have on the unsustainable fiscal position of the U.S. government when he's already acknowledged that the only reason it's sustainable now is because we have low interest rates and he may have to remove those low interest rates to fight inflation. One of the biggest problems that the Fed is looking at is how to shrink this massive balance sheet. And you're telling me they haven't spent any time talking about how to do it? They're just procrastinating all that? I mean, maybe one of the guys at the FOMC said, hey, why don't we try to figure out a plan for how we're gonna shrink this balance sheet? And someone said, nah, let's just wait. You know, why do that now? Let's just hold off and you know, we got plenty of time to come up with a plan. The reason that they have to lie is because there is no plan, because it's impossible. There is no way to do this. There is no timetable that they can come up with, no magic bullet that's going to allow the Federal Reserve to shrink this massive balance sheet without collapsing the whole economy. And so that's why they don't do it. In fact, probably it's the same reason that they don't want to model how higher interest rates would impact the U.S. government. Because if they stick that into their model and then run some simulation, it's going to show a massive economic implosion. So rather than model something that they know is a disaster, they're just going to ignore it so they don't have to face reality. The Fed's goal is to have 2% average. Obviously, the Fed has already tossed that out the window. The Fed is never going to try to average down the massive inflation that we have right now. The Fed is going to ignore this incredible increase in the cost of living and simply focus on making sure that that additional increase in the cost of living is just 2% per year without any regard to what's happened in the past and without trying to average down too high inflation the way the Fed claimed it was trying to average up too low inflation. Of course, a lot of the congressmen and senators, they wanted to blame the inflation too on the pandemic, right? As if government had absolutely nothing to do with it. We could have approached the pandemic very different. We didn't have to run these huge deficits. We didn't have to print all this money. We chose to do that just because the pandemic was the excuse we made the choice and we chose inflation. Nobody wants to level with the American public and tell them, yes, we're having to pay this price, but this is the cost of all the stimulus. You got a check, you didn't have a job, we sent you money. This is the consequence. There's no free lunch. Nobody wants to admit that. Now, of course, consumers are right to expect more inflation but they're wrong to expect it to only be 5.4%. It's actually gonna be much higher than that. So if consumers are this gloomy based on the expectation that the inflation problem will get better, imagine how much gloomier they would be right now if they actually realized that this bad problem is about to get a lot worse. So I think there's a lot of room for this index to plunge further as reality rears its head and consumers realize what's in store for them because they're still getting a lot of propaganda from the government and the media that the worst is behind us and of course all the inflation is simply a function of Russia and Putin. In fact, the Biden administration and all of the minions are now talking about Putin's price hikes. Like every time a price goes up, it's all about Putin the Putin price hikes, as if the U.S. has absolutely nothing to do with it. We're taking the Federal Reserve completely off the hook. First, it was COVID, 
and now it's Putin and Russia. In fact, it's still COVID. Whenever they talk about why prices are going up, they blame the pandemic. They blame Russia and Putin, or they blame the greedy corporations. In fact, Biden is specifically calling out the oil companies. The oil companies are responsible for rising oil prices because they're just not pumping enough oil. Obviously, if they could pump more oil at these higher prices, wouldn't they do it? I mean, don't they want to earn more money? Don't they want to sell as much expensive oil as they possibly can? The idea that they're just sitting on all this oil and not selling it is nonsense. One of the reasons that oil companies aren't pumping more oil is because of the hostility that the Biden administration has against the oil industry. People are afraid to invest in oil and gas. They're worried about more regulations. They're worried about more taxation. And that's one of the reasons that I've invested more heavily in international stocks. I know the U.S. has a proclivity of doing that, right? As soon as the oil industry really starts to make money, they slap a windfall profit tax on them. Meanwhile, when oil is low, they don't get any relief for that. But the minute they start making some money, they get taxed what kind of message does that send if you're telling these oil companies hey if you ever get to a situation where the oil price is really high we're going to seize your profits because we're going to claim it's a windfall well that discourages investment in exploration and development gold has a long way to go up because the fundamentals couldn't be better unlike for the u.s stock market where they really couldn't be worse the fundamentals for gold couldn't be better that's why it should be pretty obvious that there's still a lot of downside risk in the U.S. stock market. I mean, think about the fundamental backdrop for U.S. stocks because they remain historically overvalued at a time where the Fed is just beginning a rate hiking cycle, but it's a long road back to normal, let alone tight. So we're just starting a tightening cycle, yet we have record high valuations. We're also on the cusp of a recession. You know, even if we get a quick resolution to the Russia-Ukraine crisis, which we probably won't, but even if we do, the fundamentals are still horrible. And if we don't, they're even worse. So it's amazing that the US stock market hasn't already dropped by a greater degree than it has. That doesn't mean it won't. It just means that investors are slow to recognize these bearish factors, but they are recognizing them and they will weigh down the price of US stocks in the weeks and months ahead.